Uh, first of all, we'll do the uh, COVID update and uh, to our viewers on online, uh, we will also be talking about our back to school plans today as well. So first of all, I'll give the COVID update. I'll do a bit about touch on uh, back to school and back to work. So I think if we're going to send our children back to school, we can all go back to work as well in a safe way. So we'll discuss that as well. So today we have 8,580 new cases, uh, 2,643 uh, positive uh, rats. Uh, so tragically, um, once again, it's my sad duty to inform the public that uh, there have been uh, 13 uh, deaths um, in people aged over their 60s. The Chief Health Officer will give more information there. But can I just uh, say to the families, we express our deep condolences at this time. Uh, the Chief Health Officer will give some more information about numbers in hospital, but in encouraging news, the numbers are coming down. So we have 745 in hospital, which is down um, quite a lot from yesterday, and the numbers in ICU have come down as well to 41. And we are seeing a decline in hospitalisations in the Gold Coast, in Ipswich, in Logan and Brisbane South. So this is encouraging news, but like I said, we're still not out of the woods yet. And once again, I still stress um, that advice to our elderly about uh, not going to uh, crowded places until we get through the peak of this wave. Um, so once again, that is very, very encouraging news. We also um, have a case of that new um, Omicron variant that has been detected in one of our hospitals. And in fact, uh, Queensland was one of the first places, if you recall back in December, that actually had one of, had, who were first detected and discovered that new variant. So the Chief Health Officer will talk a little bit more about that as well. And our vaccine coverage is 91.96% first dose and 89.49% second dose. Uh, in relation to boosters, 55% of our population have had their boosters now, 1.386 million. And our five to 11 year olds is 32.69 of eligible children have had one dose that have been booked in. Can I just stress to the parents, uh, if you are wishing to get your children vaccinated, this, this week is uh, the week um, before um, children go back to school. So I'd strongly encourage you uh, to make that booking and um, it's, it's safe and effective. So uh, please think about that. But of course it comes down to your choice about that. So uh, that's uh, good news. So today I've got uh, Minister Grace here as well to talk about our back to school plan. And uh, we welcome Minister Grace back and she's fighting fit and she might actually describe to you a bit about her own experiences of going through COVID. And it just goes to show you that this variant can affect anyone in any walk of life. Um, and I'm just very glad that um, Grace and her husband have had a good recovery. So we had a good chat last night on the phone and it's good that she's here and she tested negative. So I can assure everyone that it, that it is safe. All right, so we're gonna talk briefly about our back to school program and Minister Grace will go into a bit more detail. So we want our schools to be a safe place and I want parents to have confidence and I want to have, make sure that the children know exactly what they need to go going back uh, as well. So um, we have uh, teachers, staff and children are returning next Monday, February the 7th. Now, uh, masks will be mandatory in high schools and we are strongly encouraging uh, masks from year three upwards. So um, look, a lot of people have had experience with this. We'll be making the masks available at schools as well. So uh, this is a, an added safety measure during this particular time. And don't forget, we're going through our peak at the moment and we delayed the start of the school year because of that. And you can see our numbers are coming down. So I'm very confident that we absolutely made the right decision to delay school uh, by those two weeks. Now, teachers can remove their masks to teach and students can remove them when seated. Um, and like I said, masks will be available at school. Now, it's really important uh, to uh, the whole school community, if you are sick, stay at home. Don't go to school. Just like we say in the workplace, if you are sick, don't go to work. Now, in relation to um, rapid antigen tests, I just want to let you know how that will work. So that's the rats. Now, there is no health advice by the Chief Health Officer or by AHPPC that staff or students need regular testing. On top of that, many parents have raised with me concerns about how they would administer these tests to their children. So I think we've reached a good middle point. 
Now, what that middle point means is that in relation to the rats, we will make a number of them available to uh, schools across our state. So, if a child is at school and does develop any symptoms, the parents will be called and the parents will be given a rat test to take home with that child. Likewise, if a teacher has symptoms or anyone in the school community, they'll be able to collect a rat test from the school office. So if, however, you are sick at home, uh, we would encourage you to go to one of our testing health centres. Um, there's a lot of availability at the moment because that high demand has, uh, has come down. But likewise, the school community have very good networks. So, for example, you might have um, uh, a friend down the road and they are able to get the test from the school and drop it into your letterbox. So I am quite comfortable that this is the right approach because parents are very concerned about administering it. And like I said, um, they sometimes are more comfortable taking their child or themselves to a centre, a testing centre for that to happen. But then there are some parents that would be more than comfortable testing their child and that will be, they will be available. But there is no requirement, there is no health advice to have the school community regularly tested. So I just want to make that up front and that is the decision that our Cabinet, the Chief Health Officer, myself and of course the, the um, uh, Health Minister and Education Minister uh, have made. Now because um, we can uh, get our school community going safely back to school, it is also the time to go safely back to work. So we know some of our businesses are struggling in the CBD and other parts of Queensland so, um, you know, as long as you're wearing masks indoors, it is safe to gradually return back to work. So, of course, speak with your employer, speak with your supervisors. If you're a part of that vulnerable group, of course, you may decide not to um, be returning to work at the moment until we get through um, this wave. So, uh, so very good advice there for people, but I'm quite sure that employers will be speaking with um, members of their staff to have a safe return to work. So, February 7th, Monday, February 7th, back to school, back to work. I think it all sounds good. Okay, so I might hand over to, just lost my mask. I'll hand over to the Chief Health Officer to um, go into a bit more detail about those um, hospital admissions and um, what he's seeing in relation to that. And uh, then I'll hand over to the Health Minister and then the Education Minister. Then we'll take any questions on our back to school plan first and then we'll finish with that and then I'm happy to take any other questions. So it's a long press conference today. My apologies, but we'll get through it. So thank you very much, Premier. So sadly, today we have 13 deaths to report. So these are 13 uh, Queenslanders who have died having recently had a uh, positive COVID-19 test. This includes two people in their 60s, four in their 70s, three in their 80s, three in their 90s, and one aged over 100. Five of these people were unvaccinated. Eight had received two doses, none had received a booster, none had received a third dose. Our thoughts and sympathies are very much with their families. In some good news, uh, we now have a total of 745 people in hospital being treated for COVID-19. Uh, now, that's a substantial decrease over yesterday when it was 833. So we've gone from 833 to 745. Of course, we shouldn't, you know, we, we shouldn't be paying too much attention to a single day, but that is a very substantial decline. So it's hard not, not to feel that that is a real phenomenon that we're observing. Similarly, um, the intensive care admissions have declined in the last uh, 24 hours. We've gone from 53 patients in intensive care down to 41, 41 in Queensland public hospitals uh, and f uh, 14 of those patients in uh, uh, Queensland public hospitals are ventilated. Uh, the Premier mentioned that uh, we have identified overnight a, um, a case of the BA2 uh, sub-variant of the Omicron strain of virus in Queensland. Um, you would have read about this perhaps in, um, in Denmark and, and the United Kingdom where there have been a number of isolates identified. In fact, this, this particular virus was first identified by the Forensic and Scientific Services 
a service in Brisbane uh, at the beginning of December. Uh, you might recall that we they, they identified an, a novel strain of the Omicron, a variant of the Omicron. This is, in fact, the same strain first identified here in Queensland back then. Uh, what, what we know about this strain of virus is it does appear to be a bit, a bit more contagious. Uh, it doesn't seem to be any more harmful. It's no, no more virulent than, than the standard Omicron strain. And as, it, as far as we know, and it appears that the vaccines are equally effective against this strain. So I'm, I'm not unduly concerned about it, but it, uh, in other countries, sometimes it has become more dominant over the, the original Omicron strain. But I'm not unduly concerned about this. It just appears to be slightly more contagious than Omicron, which is, is, in, in of itself is, is contagious. But the good news is that our numbers in Queensland in the last 24 hours have declined significantly, and let's hope that continues. Uh, in the coming weeks. Certainly that is what our projections suggest, that in the coming weeks we're expecting the numbers to continue to decline. I'll now hand over to Health Minister. Uh, thank you, Dr Gerard. And yeah, I do want to acknowledge uh, our amazing uh, forensics team who did identify the world first of this variant uh, that's now called BA2, uh, which at the time was uh, referred to as Omicron-like. Uh, and uh, you know we've now seen another case of that in Queensland, so we shouldn't be surprised to see more of that. I think what that reminds us all of is that uh, these are this is a highly contagious virus, and if this new uh, variant is more contagious, it means spreading even more quickly to more people. And that is um, all the more reason why people need to be getting vaccinated, whether it's their first, their second, or their booster. Uh, I want to also note that we've had 100,293 rapid antigen test uh, positives registered since we started up the register on the 8th of January. So over 100,000 positive tests that people have taken at home and registered. And I thank Queenslanders for continuing to inform us when they do get that positive test at home. And that's going to be even more important as we move forward and any uh, young children or uh, teachers and staff at our schools who have any symptoms to come forward and certainly can come forward at our testing clinics, as the Premier said, uh, where they will be able to get a PCR test. Or alternatively, they will be able to get one of the free rapid antigen tests and take a home and test themselves or, or their child, whoever's got uh, the symptom, whether it's the teacher or, um, of course, students. So they will get priority, uh, just as we've given priority to other groups uh, over our time with our testing clinics. Uh, students and staff at schools, if they have symptoms and present at any of our testing clinics, will get priority as far as being provided those free tests and also being able to get them quickly and leave the testing clinics without having to line up uh, for long periods of time. I also want to acknowledge the deaths uh, today, the 13 deaths, and pass on my condolences. I think it's really important we once again recognise that none of those people had had their booster shot. Uh, and we are seeing this time and time again. Every day we are reporting these deaths. Very few people who have had a booster shot are um, passing away from COVID. So we know that the booster makes a difference. But I also want to acknowledge, as I've said um, previously, uh, five of the 13 were unvaccinated. Now this makes up 38% of the deaths we're reporting today are unvaccinated people, even though they only make up 8% of the population here in Queensland. 38% of the deaths. So please, it is not too late to get your first dose of vaccine. There is plenty available, plenty of places to go to get vaccinated. I encourage people to come forward. Uh, the news about our uh, number of COVID patients in our hospitals is very positive to see those numbers coming down. I can report that now we have only 3,411 uh, health and uh, ambulance staff who are either positive or uh, quarantining. And that's a significant drop uh, from the 18th of January where we were over 6,000 staff were offline. Now we're down to 3,400 um, and that is great news. Uh, my last message is get your vaccination. Our 12 to 15 year olds are still not at 70% double dose. They're only 67.21% have had two doses in the 12 to 15 year old age group and they're all going back to school in a week's time. So please, parents, um, I strongly encourage if your 12 to 15 year old is concerned 
uh, about getting this vaccination, take them to a local pharmacy or to a GP to have that conversation or go into any one of our vaccination clinics and talk to the staff there and they can explain any concerns, any queries uh, that our 12 to 15 year olds may have as to why they might hesitate in getting that vaccine. It's so important they get vaccinated. Good morning everyone and it's great to be back and as the Premier said I tested negative um, yesterday evening and I gave her a call straight away to say that that was the case. But can I just make a few personal comments. Um, getting COVID is no walk in the park and I think if Michael and I hadn't been double vaxxed and boosted um, we would have had a pretty torrid time. And I'm sure that the fact that we were double, the double vaxxed and also had received our booster that it made a big difference to a couple in their early 60s who got COVID. And um, even though I described my symptoms as mild and that I didn't require hospitalisation and we didn't have a terrible case of, um, you know, not being able to breathe or anything like that, um, I wouldn't wish this on anybody. And so I would urge even more so today after having gone through this ordeal that anyone who is not vaccinated or anyone who is thinking twice about it please go and get vaccinated it is the best protection you are going to have and I'm very pleased that our 50 plus schools over the weekend and right up until the 6th of February will be providing um, vaccination for 5 to 11 year olds and indeed other age groups as well so please if you're not act, um, vaccinated as a family go and get vaccinated I found it to be the best protection and Michael says exactly the same thing. Can I also give a plug for Queensland Health? Um, I'm not just saying this because I'm a minister in the government, but they were excellent. The information that we received is second to none. It is world class. It is easy to understand. It is to the point, And they did a fantastic job in making sure that Michael and I were safe. And I want to thank them and the health minister and Dr Gerard on a job well done, um, being someone who's recently gone through it. To our health staff, congratulations. What a fantastic job they are all doing and equally as our teachers and staff in schools are doing. As you know our schools um, are back for vulnerable and essential um, workers, um, vulnerable children and essential workers and um, the first week has been fantastic. We've had about a 5% attendance and we, that's about 25,000 to 29,000 children. It's a good sample and um, we've had a very um, trouble free first week of school. Um, next week we start remote learning for 11 and 12s and we're all back to school um, on the 7th of February. We have a comprehensive back to school plan. This is um, the um, a, um, just the placemat that we've got to give um, advice. We have um, many Q&As that will be on site. Um, all, your an all your questions will be answered and we have a full week to implement largely what has already been implemented in schools over the last two years. We're refining it and we were refining it last week right up until the last day to make sure that we get the balance right and the common sense approach that we embarked upon when we delayed school for two weeks um, at the beginning and everyone back on the 7th of February. Can I say that in that delay, it's given our children the ability to get vaccinated and for us to set up these hubs so that we have more vaccination of school children when they um, arrive back at school. Um, the plan is very much about making sure that we can keep the school communities as safe as possible. And it involves, as the Premier says, a number of measures that we've already either implemented or um, making new measures measures available to them. So for example, we started last year with mandatory vaccination in line with every other state and territory. And um, I'm pleased to report that over 98% of our teachers are fully vaccinated and we have 5,000 relief staff on call that we can call upon um, who are also fully vaccinated and we have a very comprehensive staff management place um, in place. Mask wearing for all high school students and staff in line with existing um, mandate. Um, masks available and of course strongly recommended and provided for years three to six. And a range of ventilation measures um, we put a 
committee together right across the government and non-government sector. That committee included QUT, the, Dor the Dorothy um, Institute, the Doherty Institute, sorry. Um, we had um, Safe Work Australia, we had experts and um, we've refined that ventilation plan and can I proudly also say Premier, we're nearly there with every single classroom in this um, state being um, air conditioned or having manual ventilation of some sort. But air conditioning is um, almost there and there's more to say about that very soon. The temporary measures for the first four weeks, and this is because of the wave, and we want to make sure that in the first four weeks, and this is what we were refining, do we allow excursions, do we allow sporting events, do we, we allow parents onto sites, those kind of things were the refining that we were doing along a common sense approach so we could get our back to schools working and um, using the closure of schools or the closure of classrooms as a last resort. So rat, um, rats, um, rapid antigen, antigen chest, um, tests will be available in schools for students and staff who develop symptoms while on school on site and we will have um, supply and they will be provided if you're symptomatic we want to get you home and get you tested whether you're a staff member or a student and we will have those tests available um, in kits um, for students and staff to take home uh, because we don't want them hanging around the school grounds we would prefer that they leave and they get their testing done off-site as soon as possible if they're symptomatic. Also, as a health minister has said, priority access to our health clinics there for staff and students of, of school age. Um, rats will be also provided to staff entering remote communities, in particular Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. They will be provided with tests to ensure that they are COVID free before they enter those very vulnerable communities and they are being provided at the moment. Can I also so welcome my Director General Michael Darth who's here as well and who's been working him and his team extensively on this plan and while I've been at home in the last week refining it right up until the last minute so I want to thank them for their work. We are suspending um, things like school camps, excursions, large assemblies and large gatherings in schools for the first four weeks. We don't want to have unnecessary movement, we don't want to have unnecessary people coming on to school sites in this time that we are through a very difficult and ever-changing world of um, Omicron that we are facing at the moment. We want to limit visitors to school sites with exception for parents. We understand and carers for students um, experiencing vulnerability. Parents would like to escort their children onto the schools and they will be allowed to do, um, do so. And for all students in our early childhood development programs in our centres, um, parents can escort them and of course kindergarten prep and year one. So from year two upwards, we are asking parents, please um, acknowledge what the school puts in place about drop-off zones and limit your presence on school sites for the first four weeks. We will monitor this, of course. We will review it regularly and we will get information out to parents via their school communities um, you know, as often as we would need to. The department has done an excellent job in not only communicating with all stakeholders about this, but obviously also making making sure that we communicate with parents at the same time. Um, there are a number of um, you know, other um, things I think that are important, that we make sure we keep up our additional cleaning in schools. So high point areas, desktops, switches, they will all be cleaned and we will maintain our additional cleaning in schools to make sure that they are safe. We will ensure that where schools need to be um, CO2 tested for ventilation, that that will be carried out and that air purifiers provided where natural ventilation or air conditioning is insufficient. And we don't anticipate that that's going to be in too many locations. Um, you know, from the reports that we've received and all the work we've done since October last year, our ventilation plan is very well supported. Um, like I said, we want to limit non-urgent access to schools and, um, you know, obviously suspend excursions and those kinds of stuff. Can I just have a little bit of a reminder? I'd like to remind everyone that schools are currently open for vulnerable children and children of essential workers and that Queensland schools, unlike schools down south, were opened 
all, all basically all of last year. In comparison at one stage, we were the only schools on the eastern seaboard of Australia that were open and some of those schools were closed for months. So we've got a very good track record in keeping our school communities safe and in making sure in dealing with the Premier and the health advice that we receive and the department has really exercised their jurist, um, their, um, what they needed to do in schools exceptionally and I'm very proud of what they've done in light of the challenges that we've been facing for the last two years. I'd also like to remind parents and carers that while full remote learning will only be in place for year 11 and 12 from tomorrow, there are excellent resources for all students available via our Learning at Home website. As I said, our entire school communities, from students to teachers and all staff, have shown incredible resilience and patience, and I thank them for that throughout this pandemic. I want to thank them all for that, and I am sure that they will continue to do the right thing in 2022. Most importantly, if you are symptomatic, please stay at home, get tested in the priority areas and do not come to school. If you develop symptoms at school, let someone know as soon as possible and you'll be provided with whatever assistance you need to get yourself tested and back on the road to recovery should you prove pos positive. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Yeah, that's a good question, Lydia. They will go to all schools, government and non-government schools, and we have enough supply to provide a percentage that would be anticipated that may require them based upon the evidence that we have. And we will be getting more supplies and we're working with um, health and we're working with state development to ensure that we have adequate supplies. Well, we have thousands of tests available at the moment and we'll be ready for day one on the 7th of February. Oh, look, I think there's about 50,000 kits or 50,000 at the moment. We're looking at about 750 plus thousand that we will require over the four weeks. So we will have adequate supply for whoever is symptomatic and requires them. Excuse me, I need to have a drink. Yes. I think, as the Premier said, that is not what the um, advice is, but I'll give that yeah. to the Premier. Um, look, we had a meeting of National Cabinet and um, I, was, I was very clear that Queensland had not received any advice from the Chief Health Officer, nor had AHPPC recommended, this, recommended the regular testing of staff and students. It was never recommendation. Now, we always take the health advice. I'm very proud of taking the health advice. And there was no health advice to say that. But we think we've reached a good... Josh, a good middle common ground here that I think will satisfy um, the school community, but also parents, especially a lot of parents don't want to administer those tests to their children. Yep. Yep. Look, that's an entirely a matter for them. Um, but as the minister said, in New South Wales and Victoria, they have lost a lot of the school year by not being able to open because they've had the Delta virus that has gone through many of their schools. So this is about giving um, parents confidence that we will have the rat tests available at their schools if their child or teachers or anyone in the school community is symptomatic at school. It's best to get them out of the school as quickly as possible. But then too, we have very good health networks around the state. Um, and also to that huge requirement on our PCRs is not there at the moment. So there won't be any issues I can foresee getting those tests at this stage. Uh, I'll have to ask the health minister, uh, the education minister that. Any other questions on schools for me? Okay. Thank you, that's a good question. Obviously, we're restricting the access to parents um, during the first four weeks, but no, you don't have to be vaccinated to access, particularly if you're in that kindy to um, year one, you can drop your child off if you're in a vulnerable area or in our CD, um, CDEP centres as well. So no, we're not requiring vaccination, but obviously if you're a regular volunteer, like the mandate that's in place in every other state and territory, we'll, we're making sure that that is being adhered to. Um, 
Um, no, that will be based upon the health advice. That will be based upon the um, breakout at the time. You can't have a one-size-fits-all in those situations. We will be working very closely with health, with Dr Gerard. We'll be monitoring the situation, but obviously we'll be treating it like it is any other breakout at this point in time. But the closing of schools will become our last resort. Yes. All oh, right. <laughs> Dr. Gerard, sorry. Oh, I think, well, look, we're approaching that fairly quickly. Uh, we think the reason why we're just sort of nudging slowly is because there were a lot of young people who received their first dose around around Christmas time and then probably got COVID between their first and second dose and they've just delayed it slightly. We're not unduly concerned about that. Can I just ask on check-in, uh, there's data suggesting it's uh, decreasing the amount of use. Are you concerned about that? And then secondly, is there much point still? We're, we're looking at that on a daily basis and as I've said before, once we pass this peak and we're sure that everything is under control, we'll be reviewing that very actively. I mean, the, we'll probably still need those check-ins, particularly for uh, monitoring um, the vaccination passports, but we, we'll, we'll look at that very closely once we've passed the peak, which, as you know, is very close indeed. Okay. All right. I'm happy to answer any other questions. Uh, as I said very clearly, Cabinet will be considering the recommendations of the PCCC report. Uh, one of those recommendations is to set up um, uh, an inquiry into certain uh, functions of the Triple C, and that is something that Cabinet will give careful consideration to. As I said very clearly, Queensland has robust mechanisms and checks on integrity and accountability in this state. We have an integrity commissioner, we have a Triple C, which is a standing royal commission, and you know, I just want to contrast that with. What checks and balances are there federally? Surely you must be bothered by the state archive at the point today, though. You're suggesting that there was pressure to change the report. That must uh, be concerning to you. Well, people are entitled to their views and they are more entitled to their, their comments. But let me say, in relation to that report, my understanding is that report was referred to the Triple C, which was basically the foundation of their inquiry into those allegations. The Triple C did a thorough investigation. The Triple C is a standing royal commission. This is what Queensland has. Queensland has robust checks and balances on levels of government. Why wasn't that report Sorry? Why wasn't the state My understanding was forwarded to the Triple C, Josh. But should it have been well, that's a matter that's a matter for the State Archivist, my understanding, provides it to the Director General, doesn't provide it to the Minister. But, but but it all got forwarded to the Triple C, so the Triple C could have released that report. It was all forwarded to the Triple C at the time, Josh. And, and you can you can go and have it. No, it wasn't provided to Cabinet, and nor should it be provided to Cabinet. That would have been that would have been amounted to interference. Let me be very clear here. Cabinet did not see that report. Let me be absolutely clear on that. It was it was my understanding is it was forwarded to the Triple uh, C. And in fact, if you go and look at the Triple C statement at the time, it, uh, it actually says that. It says it was on that basis potential that it was referred to the State Archivist to investigate subject to close monitoring by the Triple C. The Triple C received the final report from the State Archivist on the 5th of September 2017 and formally assumed responsibility for the investigation on the 12th of September 2017 in order to determine any criminality. Yeah. It was investigated by the Triple C. The Triple C is the standing Royal Commission that we have in this state, and it is the appropriate body to investigate all of these matters. And they did so, and they did a thorough investigation. The Integrity Commission directly raised concerns about her office with Stacey Stewart, including the, um, putting the forensic exam on her laptop, as well as resourcing issues. Were you aware of these concerns were raised, and why did you 
No, Lydia, let me make it very clear. My understanding is, and I said it, uh, my understanding, if I recall, I said it on Friday, is that these matters are with the Triple C and I'm not commenting any further. It has all been investigated by the Triple C. The recommendations uh, were made to government and government implemented all of those recommendations. It was all, it was all examined, Dominique. This, is, this all went happened in 2015, 2017. It has all been examined. We understand the Triple C has finished its investigation into the politicisation of the public service. Where is that report? You ask well, you'll have to ask for the Triple C. I don't ring up... No, it would be highly inappropriate, Lydia, for the Premier to ring up the Triple C and demand a report. Honestly, well, you, honestly, you'd attack me if I did that. The Public Service Commission last year had to issue an, a directive under the um, orders of the Triple C that appointments must be merit based. Were you concerned about that? And that point to stop in, in the way that government appoints people? Uh, as I said, um, there was a recommendation made to the um, Public Service Commissioner at the time, and my understanding is it has been implemented. Sorry, sorry, sorry just to yep. say that. Yeah, it wasn't me, Josh. So you'll have to ask you'll ha you'll have to ask the minister responsible at the time, or the, or the director general at the time, because my understanding is the state archivist reports to the director general, not to the minister. You'll have to look back at that time. This is twenty. I think this is twenty seventeen. We're going back five years here. I don't remember exactly what I said five years ago. The Triple C. Uh, the Triple C received the report from the State Archivist and the Triple C issued a statement. And can I just urge you to read that statement? It was the 22nd of September 2017. Let me be very clear to all of our online followers. The Triple C issued a statement on the 22nd of September 2017. Uh, my understanding, Lydia, I'll have to double check. My understanding is that the recommendations were made to the Public Service Commission and they have been implemented by government. You'll have to ask the Triple C. Well, let me say very clearly, there has been a thorough review. The five-year statutory review, as I said on Friday, Domini, and you were at the press conference, I said very clearly on Friday that Kevin Newbury did a review. That review has gone to the Economics and Governance Committee. You follow Parliament as well. It went to the Economic and Governance Committee. Their submissions close on the 31st of January. Then they will report to Parliament, and then government has three months to then respond to that report. There has been a thorough review which the Integrity Commission actually put in a submission to, and she agreed, my understanding is she agreed to the process. What about the integrity issues raised by the former set up on this? So do you think that warrants more of a look at? The report was sent to the Triple C. Do you think there's any truth to what he's done? I mean, he's suggesting he was pressured. I mean, that's pretty concerning. Well, that, that's, that, that, that's a matter for him, and he report he forwarded his report to the Triple C. But was the Triple C aware? The Triple C are the Standing Royal Commission, the Standing Royal Commission that has a check and balance over government. There is no Standing Royal Commission that does the checks and balances over the federal government. I'm more interested in your view as Premier. Is that concerning to you that the State Archive is still... Look, we should have a, uh, a public service that um, can give fearless and frank advice. I have always... I've always had uh, that opinion of our public service and to that can I thank every single public servant who works in our state. Now unlike the LNP we don't sack public servants, uh, we don't uh, tell community organisations that they're gagged from speaking up against the government and my understanding is that the LNP actually sacked their integrity commissioner in 2014. Now Nicola, our integrity commissioner, is there until July. And it's, at second, it's halfway through her second term and she's chosen to go to another job. He seems to suggest that ability to compromise, to give that frank and fearless advice. I mean, that's the nature of what... And my understanding is he raised that with his Director-General.
that's appropriate course of action. It is absolutely appropriate course of action. Uh, not to my knowledge, Josh. You have to ask her. Yeah. Oh, well, I think that's I think that's not true at all. I think our public servants do a great job. Look how our health heroes have done an extraordinary job over the last two years of this pandemic. Um, look at how our police have done the borders, have done our um, hotel quarantine out there, um, fighting crime as well. I mean, this has been an extraordinary period of time over the last two years. And can I just say, our frontline personnel and people working behind the scenes as well have done an extraordinary job and every Queenslander um, owes a debt of gratitude uh, for the work that they are doing and the work they're continuing to do. Like it's encouraging to see that the numbers are now coming down. Like I said to you on Friday, we had those projections of needing 5,000 beds at the moment and the projections for death loss were unbelievable. And to me, Queenslanders have responded, they've got vaccinated, and as uh, the Chief Health Officer said, Queenslanders actually went and got vaccinated before we opened the borders. Families have been able to be reunited, and now families can reunite with their loved ones uh, internationally as well. Oh, look, that's a good question. I'm happy to look at to see what... Um, honestly, I think New South Wales has been impacted a lot. They've had a lot of um, um, uh, disruption over the past two years. Um, but I'm quite sure the Treasurer will, will look into those, those issues. But like I said, one of our steps we're announcing today is getting back to school and back to work. And we know that a lot of businesses um, are not getting the thorough, th thorough through traffic at the moment because of um, a lot of people as, uh, are at home, which is what we've asked people to do. And, um, you know, I think it's... Queenslanders have, have listened and they've done, they've done a great job during this pandemic. But now it's really important to get your booster. It's important to get that second dose for your children. And for your young children, 5 to 11, it's really important to get that first dose. So everyone's got a week until then. OK, last question. I think I've, I think I've stood here a long time. I think they should feel they, they can do that, Lydia, absolutely. That is um, what I would encourage them to do. Um, honestly, uh, they are doing a remarkable job. They work hard each, each and every day um, to fulfil their duties um, uh, as a public servant in this state. And, you know, unlike the former LNP that attacked them, I will not attack our public servants. OK? Thank you. Thank you.